Hello, everybody. I'm Luis Panel Ruiz, Senior Architect, Industry Specialist at Vectorworks. Let's discuss a topic I'm very passionate about, and it's a revolution in the field of interior design. Not too long ago, I had the opportunity to recreate an interesting project, a retail store from Tokyo, Japan. Besides creating all the typical architectural geometry like curtain walls and doors and ceilings, I had to take my time to put together unique custom furnishing, including a couple of cute bears. Certainly my team was very happy to see the cool renderings, but I was personally more excited about the construction drawings. Um, with the model, I was able to automatically produce great floor plans, interior elevations, and a vast number of takeoffs and schedules. Anyhow, I understand that interior designers like you are looking for a new way to be more efficient. So keep watching this video and you'll find out how you can harness the power of combining data and 3D in your creative process. Whether you are a seasoned professional or a new designer eager to explore technology, this presentation promises to be captivating and informative. So let's dive into data-driven 3D modeling for interiors. About a year ago, we were fortunate to connect with a talented design firm from Tokyo, Japan. IMA Studio has been around since the early 2000s and has completed dozens of interior projects of different sizes and complexity, ranging from product design, homes, schools, hotels, restaurants, and retail stores. The uh, Kobayashi were kind enough to trust us with their documentation of one of the latest retail projects. Upon receiving the set, we quickly realized how detailed the drawings were and the thoughtfulness of every item inside the place. Everything had a purpose and everything follow a theme. Our plan was to recreate these drawings, but from a different approach. Originally, with the idea in mind of just creating a 3D model, but later we learned that we could do more than that. Let me show you a few pictures of the place. This retail store is in Tokyo, on the second floor of a multi-use building. The business specializes in children's clothing. Familiar is the name of this phone place. Its signature is also the inspiration for the project. At the entry, you'll be received by these friendly bears, the icons of the store, playful areas, bathing stations, changing stations in the form of open eggshells, a waiting room, accent colors were also added strategically in various shapes like squares, ovals, and triangles. And a front desk. Now let's take a look at the store map and you'll quickly recognize the concept of the place. The oval and the curvy lines on the floor depict, you got it, a bare face. And most of the supporting services will be located at the top right of the map. Let me show you how we approach this project. We first establish a master file that we stored it on a cloud server. In those days, for convenience, we use Dropbox. At the same time, inside the project folder, a series of satellite files were simultaneously created. For this project, we decided to go for a more non-route, file referencing. No great magic there, we all needed to understand the benefits of encapsulating the incoming information inside design layer viewports. At the same time, we had a series of observers whom at any point could open a copy of the latest master file and review the progress. Additionally, and importantly, 
we wanted this project to be a learning opportunity for the original designers. We decided to start with a map on the wall because we had access to that illustration and it was good enough for our purposes. So here we go. From the file menu, we'll scroll down to import, then select import image. We locate the file and here we have it. I'm sure this is not going to be to scale. So uh, let me verify with my tape measure. It is incorrect. Uh, now let's fix the problem. I'll leave the image selected. We'll go to the modify menu, scroll down to scale objects. And in this window, we'll choose the uh, proper target dimension. First, we'll take this distance and here we'll type the target dimension 9.20 meters and that's it our base image is now scaled properly and uh, let me just verify the dimension and yes i can say we are good to go to recreate our existing place we decided to start with a shell by creating a column grid let me trace one here. Okay, great in place. Now to our object info palette, then I'll give it an ID. I'll type Y1. I'll make a few copies, one here, another here. Then I'll rotate it, make some more copies and I'll watch this. As I make more duplicates, the smart label changes. Uh, just a small thing, but I guess it's, it's a time saver. Now to show you precision, when I add a chain dimension, the grid lines are all linked. If we chain one dimension between these two, the grid reacts to the changes, and that is another time saver. But just remember, we're just warming up. Next in our list, columns. These parametric objects are something we can grab from our building tool set. With our grid in place, I can snap one over here. Now in this palette, I can input dimensions. For example, an overall height of three meters and define other parameters. But for ours, the base and the capital aren't needed as our columns are just simple rectangular shapes. The one feature I want you to remember here is creating a column style. The next step is to decide what parameters will be frozen by the style and what values we can provide by instance. And here we have our 12 columns in place. Now it's time to add glass walls. Not too many units, only three. Something easy to handle. For this task, I'll trace what looks like three simple walls, like so. Let's change the height to three meters. Then we'll switch the type to curtain wall. Now, let me show you how we can edit this curtain wall. I'll press this button here on the object info palette, curtain wall grid. First, we can alter the uh, number and distance of the horizontal and vertical grid. In here is where we can get very creative. Then there are two settings we can adjust, the frames and the panels. Uh, let's start with the frames. Here we can define the geometry for each frame depending on its location, the verticals, horizontal, the start, the end, and top and bottom frames. In the definition pane, we'll define the type and on the right side, we can control the look and feel of the frames in 2D plans, for example, or in 3D views. The panel settings is very easy. We can define the type, the glass thickness, and its attributes. Like many other objects, curtain walls can also be a style for better control and organization. Let's move on to the walls. Uh, these are nothing problematic to create, 
I believe I've shown you in previous webinars how to draw walls, but in this time I want to show you different, a different way, maybe something that will make you a faster drafter. Okay, so you just saw me creating a network of lines. Now let's simply select them all. Uh, while I right click on the mouse, I'll find the menu Create Objects from Shapes, one of my favorites. Then I'll scroll down the list until we find Walls. Done. All my lines have now been replaced. Now our job is to simply clean up those joints. To make things easier, we can always press our spacebar and trigger the uh, Smart Options display. Um, from here, we can select whatever joint mode we need. Good, good. We got our generic walls in place. Everything is ready. As always, if needed, we can create a wall style. We are now getting to the doors, and this part is actually very easy. This project has several existing doors and just a few are new. Just a matter of selecting our door tool and drop it in the proper location. For this one, I'll play with the width dimension and change the operation to packet door. If I get a little deeper in the settings, I can make some changes to the door leaf. For example, switching the door from a simple solid leaf to a panel and change the number of vertical and horizontal panels. As usual, once we are all content with the settings, we create a new door style. Again, like I said before, creating styles is a good habit. Now, let me duplicate this door a few times on this wall. And from this view, you can see how these fields are all available. I can change the leaf dimension of this selected door and the other ones, as you can see, don't get affected. But if I get back to this window and just for fun, I could update the style of the door, like adding more panels to the leaf and then accept the changes. All doors will update automatically. So keep that in mind. The use of styles will bring you a lot of benefits. Let's talk about spaces. This task is somewhat time consuming if you only do it in CAD. Let's say that you need to label your rooms and display the name, number, and area. That'll require typing and drafting polylines or something like that just to get the proper label. And what if your walls change and get moved? Ah, then we have to chase all the changes. So let me show you a tool that'll work to your advantage. From the Space Planning toolset, let's select the Space tool. Then we'll select from the resources a type of space label that is good for our needs. Now with a single click inside each room, we'll place the space object. Here, 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 here. Okay, that did not take long, but we can do it a lot faster. Let me show you another way. We're going to select all of these walls and from the architectural menu, we locate space planning and to the right is the one that we need. Create spaces from walls. Done. Remember we talk about those changes? Look what happens when we move this wall to the right. The rooms adjust and the areas update. Big time saver. The proper name and ID for every room can be adjusted from the info palette. The space tool is very robust and we done full webinars on it, but for now, I just gave you the big picture. Uh, so far, everything that I'm showing you corresponds with our project timeline and the next task we needed to complete was adding floor finishes. I remember that it was a, a bit of a head scratcher because whatever tool we use needed to satisfy four concepts. They needed to look good on top plan view, easy to edit in 3D, and also they need to show textures. And also something that we could quantify, for example, like getting the square meters. 
So we said to compare these exactly four objects that I have on screen. On the left side, we have a simple rectangle. The pros, the material look good in 2D, and the diet is available, but no 3D. So that will not show up when we cut those sections. The empty square next to it is an extruded object. So it doesn't work for 2D drawings, but checks the boxes for the other three concepts. The floor object and the slab object, uh, the one that includes subcomponents, do provide all of the concepts. Now, if we look at them in a 3D view, the uh, simple 2D rectangle would just not work for our renderings. It has no texture properties, and for 2D is fine. That's it. The other three, in comparison, can take care of the job. If we switch the view to our slab object, you can see that it contains lots of components. For example, concrete insulation, subfloor, uh, the wood flooring, etc. Uh, looks very good, right? But there is one thing. This project is for interiors, and there is no need for cutting structural sections. Uh, just interior elevations would be sufficient. And that is the reason why we chose a good old floor object. Simple, easy to reshape, uh, works for what we wanted. So the lesson here is make your own checklist and think what kind of geometry checks all the boxes for your next project. Now let's look up and work on creating ceilings. We don't have much going on over here, only three objects, so the same approach will apply to all. What we chose to do with these items was transforming them into hybrid symbols or blocks. Just like our library content for furniture, same steps. But these will look perfect in 3D and in 2D. Let me show you the concept. Previously, I had traced a novel shape. Now we'll create a new one with the offset tool. While the two are selected, I'll make use of some traditional 2D commands like clip surfaces. And now we have this ring. Next, let me first select it and switch to a 3D view. I'll get one of my favorite tools, the push pull. I'll select the surface, pull, I will type a thickness of just a few centimeters. Then, I know we haven't talked about the uh, textures, but this is one way of applying a finish to this object. Through the Object Info Palette, we can search and grab one from the list. Now, this section is key. Creating a hybrid symbol has two parts. The 3D geometry and 2D shapes depending on the view. OK, I'll select the extruded oval, and from the Modify menu, we'll trigger the Create Symbol Menu command. I've already created one. It looks sort of OK in top view, but it does look good in 3D. In order to add a 2D component, let's get into the Edit mode. Now we need to locate from this floating bar the top view, which as you can see, is empty. And here I'll paste a copy of the dashed lines, and I'll move them right in the center. When I exit the edit mode, our hybrid symbol is ready to go, and all we need is to place it in our model as a floating ceiling. Let's put pause for a moment from tools and menus, and let's review what we have. We have our walls in place, our doors, floor finishes, and ceiling objects. I think it all looks good from what I can see. I guess we're making progress. And now it's time to furnish the place. On a side note, these type of navigations are very enjoyable with the new M1 systems. Let's make use of content that is already made and ready to drag and use. 
first questions everybody has is, where do we get this from? This application comes with a resource manager window. My recommendation is type in the name of the object we're looking for and let the search do the rest. Chairs, found many. Shelves, here we have them. And for bathroom items, I found quite a few. Once found, we can drag and drop onto the design layer. For our project, I believe shelves, sinks, and toilets were the ones dragged out of the standard content library. In the case of this project, we needed to create a series of symbols for all of our lighting objects. There are about close to 20 different types. These vary in size, shape, and light intensity. Most of them are ceiling mounted, but we also have some hanging lamps and a few slim lights. I've shown you the process on how a light symbol can be created in some older YouTube videos, but my colleagues here thought it would be a good idea to bring it up as a reminder. So here we have our 3D geometry. Nothing extraordinary, just a metal plate and a diffuser. The modeling is straightforward, but the one suggestion that I want you to take with you is placing a spotlight just beneath the glass object, not inside, and point it down. Also, during this process, it's always good to make use of multi-views. Moving to the right, in our info palette, we can set the cone spread. I think we did it 100 degrees and then change the color setting to a warmer color. We could go even deeper, but for our rendering purposes, this was good enough. And let's not forget to name this light object. That'll make things easier later on. When I talk about the organization of the file, I mentioned that several people would contribute with modeling different units, like desks, tables, and shelves. Each of these helpers delivered a file that included a very generic item. We didn't add textures from the beginning, just pure geometry. Each of the files were placed in a folder, and in our master file, we created individual references. You can see here that in order to keep things easier to understand, several design layer for millwork units were added. The references are encapsulated in what we call design layer viewports. That way, we were able to control the visibility of each unit. For example, if I select one of these viewports, you can see that some of these have more than one layer and in many cases, multiple classes. But none of these classes made it into a master file organization. Let's navigate around the model, and, and I'll show you some of these custom units. We're going to analyze how some of these were actually made. I'm going to stop here and force select this item so we can be transported to the actual source. It is just a matter of double-clicking on the viewport. This unit was done by one of my colleagues, and that's why I invited my good old friend, Wes Garner, who is going to tell us about his modeling secrets. Glad to have you on board, Wes. Uh, thanks, Luis. This has been a really cool project with lots of bits and parts, and you've pulled it together really nicely. So, like you've suggested, let's have a look at some of the geometry and the hows and whys certain techniques were used. We'll take a look at a couple of the elements that went into making the space. First, I'll focus on what I'll call the reception desks, but you can clearly see from these images that they serve multiple purposes. It looks like you can learn how to care for your newborn, and personally, 
as a parent and grandparent, I can say unequivocally that there are some tips and tricks that need to be learned. So anyway, looking at the casework, there's a pink cabinet and a blue one that both share similar materials and construction techniques. I knew that in the end we'd be creating construction drawings, which we'll discuss in a later segment. But in order to achieve this goal, the models of these objects would need to be created as if you were actually building them. To start, I took a look at a layout scheme that would help with the curved geometry and used several of the radius dimensions that were given to us to start with developing what would be the 3D model. These were all just 2D lines and arcs. The next step was to start creating various surfaces and solids that would eventually be knitted together into one surface that would closely approximate solid surface material. As you can see from the object info palette, there are extrudes, NURBS curves, and surfaces and shelled objects, all of which need to maintain a thickness of just 5 millimeters. This is the result of 5 millimeter skin with all the required opening. The next step was to create the underlying structure for the cabinet. This would be a material like plywood or particle board and would need to show in section details. We'll look at them in a bit. So more careful modeling was required, starting with an extruded element and subtracting out voids that would represent the spaces for both drawers and the spaces under the drawers that would be covered by the curved doors. Here, as I toggle between two saved views, you can see the interior of the cabinet as well as the doors and drawers. The drawer fronts and doors are simple extruded elements. You can see as I edit one of them that they are created from polylines and then extruded a set distance to give them height. The finger pull was then created by a solid subtraction. Here's another bit of casework that I tackled that includes some bookshelves or display shelves and then sort of a banquette seating section. And here's an image of the actual object. The modeling challenge was to create the curving extruded seating element and then slice it into nicely proportioned sections. After that, the edges needed to be filleted to give them a more realistic look as if they were leather-covered cushions. The remainder of the modeling involved techniques we've already seen, like creating surfaces and extruding elements. Creating the raised signage was a matter of taking text of the appropriate size and font, and then simply extruding it. The result, after giving it a glow texture, is something that approximates neon lighting. And here's an early rendering of the text as we were working through just how much glow to give it. And that's about all for me in this segment. Back to you, Luis. Thank you again, Wes. Gracias. Always, always good to work with you. You know, there is one piece that I was among my favorites while I was modeling. So I decided to save a series of steps so we can show it later. And this is the unit, one of the open eggshells displays. When I started, I had this drawing for information, and this gave me all the dimensions I needed. So the first step was to model the top half. I thought I could create this shell by using a couple of nerves curves, one for the rail and the second one as a profile. The second mode of the loft tool is the one that solved the challenge. The result was a loft surface. Okay, step two. I had a series of radial lines as guides and used them to create and extrude a polyline. That is the green solid over here. Then from a front view, slice just the bottom portion of the eggshell. 
The green solid object needed to be edited in the shape of a wedge. There are different ways to achieve this, but I think I use the uh, split tool. Then I used a duplicate array menu command and made several copies around the center of the eggshell. The next step was to add them all and fuse them into a single solid. The idea there was to create the teeth effect I was looking for, the bite, and then subtract it from the yellow surface. Now, with only two objects remaining, we could add solids and create a single item. Since we wanted to continue with a nerve surface, we use the Extract tool in the Extract Surface mode. As I've shown you in other videos, giving a thickness to a love surface is just a matter of using the Shell tool. So we're done with the top shell, and now we needed to create the diffuser that goes inside. This was a given, simple task of creating extrudes from circles. Once we assembled the top part, it was just a matter of duplicate and mirror so we can get the bottom half and then edit the surface just a bit. And at the end, just like I showed you earlier, we turned this into a single hybrid symbol, including its 2D representation. So you'll see it again in some of the renderings later on. So, by now, we have given you a recipe for putting together our store. And now we're going to move on to a different chapter. The benefits of involving data into our workflow. Data visualization allows us to control the attributes of objects in a design layer or on a sheet layer viewport, according to the data present. This method produces a flexible display based on type of objects, values, or by ranges of values. For example, our space objects. These provide area data. By activating one of our custom data visualization, we can identify rooms based on their size. I think I assign blue to the biggest open space in the store, and the smaller rooms get other colors. Now, I want to show you other uses for identifying objects based on types. This idea came around when we were asked what 3D tools we were using more frequently during the modeling phase. So, to answer that question, we created a series of useful data visualizations. This one shows in orange the existing shell of the project. Now in red, we can identify the extrude along path objects, like some of the ring racks and the low glass partition. This one locates all of the objects that have volume, because they were created as extrudes or as a result of a push-pull operation. Here in green, we see the objects identify as solid additions. I see Wes use that one very often for his units. Now in blue, we see the opposites, subtraction operations. I know we use this one many times, showing in light blue color what objects are actually symbols. I guess everything. So my message is, data visualization can be used at any point during the making of a project. You can use it for design purposes or as part of your final presentation. All right, we have shown you the behind the curtain steps on how we put this 3D model together. That is all good. Things went well. And now here comes a new benefit, creating inventories. Yes, we know that we can count symbols like lighting objects. That is a given. Also, the number of chairs and tables and things like racks and shelves. No problem but creating worksheets including information of every item like ID codes, a description, colors, manufacturer, and even links to websites. That is another ticket. 
and a very interesting power out of mixing 3D models with data. I'm sure by now you're wondering, and how? Well, I'll try to make it simple. When you get to this phase, you'll be living basically between these two menu commands, creating reports and preparing custom records. We thought about showing you the records we prepare for our interior project. We named them casework take-offs, finishes, furniture, lights, ceiling speakers, and other miscellaneous take-offs. To the right of this resource manager window, you can tell what field value were created for each record. Now, we thought that it would be to everyone's benefit to go over the steps to creating a record format. Nothing complicated. So let's start here. The new resources button triggers this window. Then we'll select create a record format. We can start by typing a name that best describes your new record. And now we just need to press a new button every time we want to add a new item to our list. For example, name, I'll type ID, type of field, text is fine. Any defaults, we can leave this one blank or just give it a dash. Then you repeat this process for every new field. Once we are done, we can always go back and edit the type or make new changes. And from my experience, I never get it right the first time. Once you have your record format in place, an easy way to link data to objects is by going around the model. Pick an object and while selected, go to the data tab in your info palette and assign one or multiple records to it. Then, these empty fields down here are ready for you to be filled with whatever information you have at hand. I know that in our case, we went back and forth adding information as it became available. Once we took the time to add our new data, we were able to tell what these items were, what codes they were assigned, and in some cases, what the projected cost of the unit would be. I'm going to move on and talk about reports. Although there are quite a few reports preloaded that we can use, we did create several of our own. But let me show you the steps for creating a custom worksheet. By pressing again our new resources button, we trigger this window and select worksheet. Here we can give it a name. Try something that makes sense to you. Now we have an empty worksheet with a few rows and columns. Let me zoom in just a bit. If this is your first time, I'll make it easy. Position your pointer over the number one row. Then right click on the mouse and display this submenu. Scroll down and select create a report. Then let's jump to criteria. Find objects that have records attached to them. Okay, now what is that record? I have a list here with lots of them, but I'll select the one that we made before. Casework takeoffs. Then we'll go over the columns for the worksheet. I'll select the headers I need from this left side and add them to the right where I can rearrange them as I need them. We click OK, and there we have our raw worksheet. You can tell that it's not yet formatted with pretty cell colors and fonts. To better organize this report, we can select this small arrow and change the sorting information on this column to ascending. That makes more sense to me. Here's something cool about light worksheets. Did you know these reports can automatically help us locate items in our model, like this corner custom unit or the central desk 
and many other displays. Now that you learn about our data handling process, let me show you some of our final formatted reports. Here's one we use for lighting objects, including symbols images, Caseworks report, our space programming, and a furniture inventory with descriptions. I know that in a few minutes, we're going to show you some of the drawings produced by this project, but let me skip ahead and I'll bring your attention to our reflecting ceiling and lighting plan. This is a great opportunity to mention another tool that is related to our topic, the data tag. This is fairly a newer tool that is meant to be a time saver, but it is also quite smart since it does more than just labeling objects. I'll go ahead and show you how we were able to incorporate this tool. First, I'm going to get inside this viewport into the annotation environment. Next, from our Deems and Notes tool set, we'll select the Data Tag tool. Then up here in the mode bar, we pull down a list of available tag styles. We have quite a few tags ready to be used along with others that we prepare for a project, but let's select the one for lighting object. When the data tag second tool mode is selected, it'll pull down its data information from the object beneath it. In this case, this tag is looking for the ID number. This is totally fine when it's just for a few items, but when you have hundreds, in that particular case, the next tool mode will automatically populate tags everywhere where information is available. And this is what makes data tags one of my favorite tools. Here's a second hidden attribute to this label tool. Let me get a bit closer and select one of these. The label says L4. If I wanted to give it a different ID, Instead of going all the way to a design layer and find the object, I can change the data value right here because data tags interact with custom records. Now, I'm going to anticipate one common question. You may ask, hey, Luis, is there a way to change the shape of the tag, like adding more lines or change the shape or just make it a different color? Well, yes. From the Resource Manager, locate the Data Tag Plugin object. Then do another right click and find the Edit menu. This button down here takes care of the layout. And now you can do whatever changes you like. Maybe just reshape it a bit. We could pull this corner here and maybe move this other corner to the side. Then we'll exit this environment and all of our tags have been updated. We're very sure that you will enjoy the use of data tags. Since we were having so much fun with this retail store, we even decided to add some merchandise props on the shelves and racks. And no, we don't have a t-shirt tool, but we found a happy way to create those toddler tops. But now it's time to show you more interesting ways of extracting views that'll be part of our final drawing set. There is more than one way, but one of my favorites is by making use of our good old clip cube. Once the clip cube is activated, we can adjust the top to whatever height we need. ClipCube is great as a presentation tool, but also if you right-click on the surface, you'll be able to create a section viewport. Now from the side, we could push back the face and again, trigger more section viewports. You'll see them in just a moment. Anyways, here's our very first drawing. This is a vacant space with the existing columns and walls. It is just a single viewport showing only a few design layers and objects assigned to classes. 
we added a D-sized title block with its border and we were in very good shape. A project planning sheet is based on showing those space objects, but now in grayscale mode. And here's our main sheet, the proposed project floor plan. But if you look closer, you'll see that even at this level, we can still make use of our 2D embellishing tools to make our drawing not only informative, but also appealing. We gave it a bit of drop shadow to our furniture objects. Just a little something to make him stand out. Here's our proposed floor finishes where we can see those materials in gray scale. I think they look quite good. Hopefully they will print well and not too dark because I don't think I tested that. Here's a drawing for furniture and custom millwork units. We also added ID levels by using more data tag objects. And here are some of the interior sections we pulled from our clip queue. I'm just glad that this took no time to process with this M1 Mac. Also keep in mind these viewports can be shown in hidden line mode, so they look like a traditional CAD drawing, but we can also show this in colors or even in full realistic rendering modes. And speaking of drawing sets, I'll invite our friend Wes to share his screen again. I believe he'd like to tell us all about how to export and share these drawings. Come in, Wes. So yeah, thanks, Luis. Earlier I talked about the fact that this challenge was not only to create models of the various elements within the store, but also to be able to extract construction drawings from the model. For me, being able to anticipate what views I may need and how I'm going to go about getting there is an extremely important part of the modeling process. For the reception desk, we were able to reproduce plan views, elevational views, as well as detailed views as shown here. And the real bonus was that we could then show any view, including axonometric views, as well as some of the fantastic rendered views that Luis has shown. And of course, all of the data and costing that was derived from the model. So yes, is there a bit of upfront time required to build a model? Sure, but I believe in most cases, the benefits of having done so far outweigh the typical 2D workflow. So after all the modeling is done and the sheets have been composed, how do you distribute your work? In many cases, a set of drawings is required to get a building permit or an electronic distribution is required to send sheets to consultants. Here's a way to do just that. We'll just go to our publish command and choose the sheet layers. From here, as you can see, we can publish any or all the sheets as DWGs or DWFs. We can print them out or leave them as PDFs. You can also choose to save a set of drawings as something like, I don't know, 80% completion set, which can then be acted upon immediately or recalled at a later date. In fact, you may be required to include drawings from your consultants. You can do that, too, by simply selecting this Add Items from Other Files option and selecting the files. And so with that, I'll pass the microphone back to you, Luis. Got the mic back. And Wes, I am glad that you suggested that although this webinar focused on 3D and data, we should finish on a light note and show some of our project renderings. On this screenshot, you'll see our personal recipe for the type of graphics we produce during the months we work on this project. Typically for the modeling revisions, we use the first three on the left. We use a lot of artistic sketches and white models and stay away from textures, driving the conversations only to the geometry. For navigation and early presentations, we use shaded styles. And at that point, we started adding colors and suggested the materials that we were adding. 
Interesting enough, for faster and decent renderings, we started using our new Redshift style. I recommend that you give it a try. I think it'll make your renderings go quicker and you'll be happy with the results. And for our final realistic renderings, we created our own rendering styles. And these are some of the final renderings done with our own software. Each published and processed in the cloud. Here's a nice interior shot taken from one of the corners. I'm very pleased with the lighting on this one. We try to balance the power of the ceiling lights with the ambient light. This one is from behind one of the eggshell displays and looking towards the play area. I know that in this shot, we took a bit of extra care on setting the bloom camera effect. This next view is by the main open area. Behind the workshop tables and looking at the first 1000 days sign. I say this one looks just like the real photograph. And my very own favorite are friendly bears who welcome all of the nice visitors. Thank you again, and we'll see you soon.